It's Gahandagwa's Diane Longboat from Six Nations. I, I want to welcome everyone to this webinar and to thank you for your patience as we went through our technical challenges this morning. We're going to be looking at two templates. First, um, a First Nation education law template for First Nation governments so that they can begin to codify um, their education systems, standards, um, employment, and, and um, purpose of education. And so this template um, is in its full fullness can be found on the onika.onika.com website. Um, it is the, one of those um, papers that's 90 pages long. So what we're going to be seeing today is a synthesis of some of the thinking behind that paper, um, the philosophy of it, um, the pieces of it that um, should be put in place when you're going to make an education law for your First Nation. So um, I'm going to, to do parts of the presentation, stop and, and seek your questions and comments, and then move on. And so we're going to begin first with the First Nation education law template. So the, the full purpose of all of our work in First Nation education is to make a, a really awesome life for these young people who are the rights holders. They're the ones who carry forward the legacy on our behalf. We're the ones carrying the legacy for the ancestors and they're going to be carrying it forward. So they are the rights holders individually and collectively as we form a First Nation, we are um, collective rights holders. So these templates were talked about as early as the fall of 2012. Um, the origin of them came from the Sisseton, Wapitan, Dakota Nation in uh, North Dakota. And when I looked at their education law that has been in effect since 2007, I began to look at <clears throat> some of the, um, uh, the depths of the, their institutional development, but also the commitment of, of the tribal nation to um, the future of their children, being Dakota. Within, um, within the Americas. So we began discussions on an education law for First Nations in Ontario. And the very first um, presentation on this topic was done at a Chiefs of Ontario Education Conference back in uh, the fall of 2012. So <clears throat> during, you, you'll remember that during last year, the Chiefs of Ontario ran three focus group sessions and a conference in May and uh, came forward uh, with a series of resolutions called Charting Our Own Path Forward. One of those resolutions uh, was authorizing the development of templates by ONICA to support First Nations in building independent education capacity. And in, these templates are done absolutely without prejudice to First Nations who are undertaking education negotiations and without prejudice to First Nation rights and initiatives. So we know that Grand Council Treaty 3 is in the process of developing their own education law, as is Anishinaabe Aski Nation and Anishinaabek Nation. So these templates are <clears throat> really um, a process, a thought process for First Nation governments to engage in when they're doing their own community-based education laws. And then, of course, we had an ONICA resolution authorizing um, money to um, hire me as consultant to put this together. And that resolution came forward in May of 2013. And um, when the funds were discussed about where you know, we could pull funds for, for the contract, it, the total amount of these funds came from the membership fees because at that conference, the members of ONICA, in, of which there are about 211 districts throughout Ontario, were uh, really supportive of um, the whole notion of a template so that a First Nation could build its own education law. So if we were to, if we were to say, you know, what is your one wish as um, Indigenous peoples in our homelands, it is to remain so and um, to do everything that we need to do with our children so that they understand their history, their rights, their treaties, 
um, to understand their languages, their cultures, their spirituality, their ceremonies, and all those things that make us unique and really beautiful as, as nations. So when we look at um, the education law template, we need to be able to pull authorities together that give us um, the mandate to make these education laws. And the thing that, that really authorizes us as First Nations is that we have original and sacred law that was given to us by the Creator. And those sacred laws appear in many forms. They appear in um, song, in ceremony, in prayer, in birch bark scrolls, in wampum belts. They're, they're recorded um, on rocks, rock paintings, rock carvings, uh, glyphs, um, also rock formations. So that original sacred law talks to us about our responsibilities as First Nations to protect and care for our homelands, to be in good relationship with all living beings as well as each other as nations. So um, that law is the most fundamental law and it is put in place to preserve um, the continuance of life as we know it. Based on that, that law and occupation of our homelands, we have inherent rights. We also have indigenous rights and treaty rights. And international laws and, and covenants and codes and declarations support us in that. And there's also many, many court decisions in Canada that have supported our rights. And those court decisions and the results of those deci decisions have never been fully implemented. So that's something we also need to have a look at and work on. Um, government draws their authority from man-made law and their Constitution Act of 1982 and of course the Indian Act. So these are the sacred laws that I'm referring to. And when you see that wampum belt in the second picture at the bottom on the right-hand side, that's a friendship belt that is um, made from beads from that quahog shell, the purple and the white, and they're drilled to form beads. And it's a friendship belt between Haudenosaunee, Iroquois people, and Anishinaabe people. So we had... Um, tribal relations, international types of relations long, long before Europeans came here. So our sacred laws give us the power to do what we need to do for our children. And that's where we really need to focus our attention as well as drawing from those sacred laws to make our own education law. Because that is something that the government of Canada, which is man-made, does not have. They don't have the authority and the power given by the Creator. So you'll see you know, all the things that we just talked about, including the cycle of ceremonies, the medicine lodges, the medicine societies, and the prophecies. So when we look at an education law for a First Nation government, we see that we are well supported by international recognition of self-governance over education. And there are many, many uh, references inside the long paper on education law template that appears on the ONICA website. So some of those references are instruments, like the human rights instruments, the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples, also um, international standards that have been set in place by the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, the Convention, on the Rights of the Child, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and then many covenants passed at the UN, of which Canada is a signatory. So the Covenant on the Rights of the Child, the Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So <clears throat> before we go on to lawmaking protocol, we'll just um, go back to um, authorities and rights and see if you have any comments or questions to this point. John? Uh, I'm not seeing uh, no questions as, as yet, Diane. Okay, I'm going to continue then. 
So when a First Nation government with its community members decides that it's going to make its own law, um, what happens is that there, the First Nation government will usually put in place a protocol. And that's really, the, the details of that protocol are in the second PowerPoint we're going to look at today. Um, but in a very general sense, the First Nation government has that power to enact and to amend laws. The right to self-government means the right to make laws. And so the First Nation government drafts the education law. That doesn't mean that chief and council have to do it, but they have to authorize a technical team to be able to pull together what they believe to be um, the first draft of an education law. And when they do that, um, the, the draft comes forward back to chief and council, and the chief and council then will post the law and make copies available at the administration office for anyone who wants to come and pick it up. And chief and council will also make sure that there's a discussion guide in all the languages of daily usage and in the community. And also that there's a summary that has been produced that is a, a, a quick, um, easy way to understand what's in the law and how it affects your education as a, a family within the community. So then there'll be a series of community meetings or focus group meetings. Uh, you can Diane? Give, yep. Uh, I yep. have a question here. Okay. <clears throat> what about the rights of a citizen of Canada to equal education that was granted in the Constitution Act of 1982? Um, I'm not sure I understand what that question means. Because Canadians, uh, Canadians were granted that, the right to education, um, and the federal government transferred that right to each province and territory, and um, it appears in Ontario as the Education Act of Ontario. So they have a provincial, provincially enacted right to education. Ours is, is still federal because we're, we're operating on a nation-to-nation -nation basis with the Government of Canada. Okay, thanks, Joanne. I'll, uh, um, sorry, thanks, Joanne, Diane. I'll, um, as we get more, I'll just uh, maybe try and find a good spot to pose those. Um, so again, Joanne is saying the Constitution gave us the right to funding at the same level as public and separate boards. I see, yes. Yes, absolutely. The Constitution um, implies equal rights for all people within the borders of Canada. And um, we have a human rights case against Canada because we, we are seriously and chronically underfunded for a couple hundred years now. So um, Joanne's absolutely right about that. Um, I'm going to pick it up again for lawmaking protocol. So the, the community meetings and focus group meetings um, can be held throughout the community. You can give 30 days notice, 60 days notice, whatever you want in terms of uh, your community function. Um, smaller communities can afford to give a 30 day notice, but larger communities may choose uh, 60, 90 days notice. So the important thing to remember in the template is that there will be a lot of things in there that are very useful to you, but there will be a lot of things that you say, I don't need this or we already have this and I can just pull it from our files. So that's the beauty of the template is that you, you get to see what you've already accomplished and then what are the outstanding pieces that form a work plan for yourself. So once these community meetings are, are in swing, then the, the members can suggest amendments and they, they can change any of that draft education law that they're discussing at, the t at those tables. And they can do it in writing. And if they're not comfortable doing it in writing, we always say that um, people can make an oral uh, declaration or deposition to someone at the um, administration office and have their comments on the education law recorded or their questions. So after the community meetings, 
and all of the, the feedback from community members has been gathered, there's another 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, whatever you want to make it. And again, the community can come together. And at that time, there's a very special meeting that's set up to look at just the education law. And you can decide at that time whether you want a community referendum where everybody in your community votes, or you can have authorization that, that the First Nation government will vote on your education law. So depending on your membership code and how many of your members live off reserve, how many live on reserve, and do the off reserve people have voting rights, you know, it depends on your membership code. So you have to be careful about that piece, about how it's all going to fit together. So very generally, that's the lawmaking protocol. Because we can't just say, oh, we're going to make an education law. We have to have a process in place. And the advantage of this process is that everybody in the community has the opportunity to participate if they want to. It's an open process. It's transparent. And it allows um, several feedback mechanisms so that if you didn't get a chance to say something the first go around, there's an open door for you to always make your comments. Until that vote goes through by the First Nation government, or by a community referendum. So I'll stop there. John, are there any questions to this point? Uh, I'm not seeing uh, anything else, no questions or comments uh, to this point. Okay. Then let's look at why we're doing our own nation law in education. First of all, because we believe, and this is um, a deep, treaty-based and rights-based belief that we are nation building. We're rebuilding the nations that were here originally and we're restoring their strength, languages, cultures, civilizations, we're restoring them. Because so much was taken away in colonization and in the residential school system. So this really is a tool for nation building. We also believe that First Nations have never relinquished our claims to sovereignty or to our homelands, and that we hold a right to autonomy in our own internal affairs. We also believe that education law establishes self-determination and jurisdiction over education. And that's so important. That piece is very important because if you do not have an education law in place, someone else will and they will apply their law to you, which is what we see with, um, as Joanne raised that, that question about the Education Act of Ontario. You know, others will occupy the field if we don't. So we, we want to make sure, as First Nations, that we enact our inherent rights and our treaty rights to education. We have to begin to describe that now in our own education law about the purpose of education, the definition, the goals, the kinds of uh, curriculum and standards and programming and, and, and uh, teacher competencies that we want to have for our children in our systems. Because that is then bringing alive what our ancestors said was going to be education for a good life for our people. And then of course, Always, the right to self-government is the same as the power to make laws. And we can never forget that, that we have, we have that power to make our own laws. So this, is, this next slide is called First Nation Governments and Lawmaking. And this kind of shows you a general process. So many First Nations um, in Ontario are not yet at the point of developing their own constitutions. I think Nipissing First Nation with Chief Mariana Cucci, uh, there was an announcement just shortly that, that they had developed their own constitution. Um, and other First Nations are going to follow suit. So this is now um, a wave of development that we're going to see as our First Nation governments uh, come into the fullness of their operations. Some of us are not there yet. We don't have a constitution at Six Nations, but that doesn't mean that we won't in the future. But in the meantime, 
what we need to start thinking about is our feelings and beliefs about sovereignty and about jurisdiction over education and start to think about a tool called the Protocol for Lawmaking that we would put in place to make our own laws. And then that, that's, that really leads into developing a First Nation government constitution. So that's, that's a long process. It's a bit of work, but it's important work because it stabilizes that First Nation government <clears throat> within the borders of Canada as a sovereign nation. Some people um, don't want to believe um, in sovereignty or enact sovereignty, and that's their, their total right. But I can tell you that the laws of the United States um, are set in place so that the U.S. federal government recognizes U.S. tribal nations as sovereign nations within the borders of the United States. So this is not a new concept. Um, so once that First Nation government eventually has its constitution in place, um, uses a protocol for lawmaking, in the meantime it's going to start to develop its First Nation education law. And then that law authorizes the First Nation school authority to take responsibility for the operations of education in that community and also be responsible for students who are attending schools outside of the community via uh, tuition agreements and post-secondary education, training, specialized training, and so on. So <clears throat> the school authority has re total responsibility for that, but they report to the First Nation government. <clears throat> the First Nation school authority also has the ability to develop contracts and buy services, specialized services, as it needs. And it can contract with a regional First Nation education authority for second or third level services. It can contract, of course, with a school board or um, with um, specialized therapeutic services that might be available for um, special needs children. So that's kind of, um, when you see this slide, it, sh it shows you a pathway for developing a law. And this is really the meat of our discussion on education law, this slide number 11. Because slide number 11 goes through the main chapters of the education law template document on the ONECA website. That is that document that I referred to earlier that's 90 pages long and gives you lots of options lots of content on how to develop your law. So we start off by saying, you know, that it's important to have a constitution because this law is a part of that constitution. If your First Nation government has taken over health, health needs to formulate its own law to be part of that constitution. And so you start to see how things develop in the next you know, 20, 30 years, you start to see an evolution here for our governments. The education law has guiding principles. And those are the core principles that we believe are so incredibly important to transmit to the coming generations of our children. Those are the, the, the reasons why we're doing this work in education. They're non-negotiable. Our culture, our language, our spirituality, our ceremonies, our treaty rights, inherent rights, history, knowledge of our history, knowledge of our lands for land-based learning, non-negotiable. So that has to be put into your law. Also definitions. What do you believe the purpose of education to be? Um, what, do you, what do you want as your outcomes in education? What are those things that you want to protect? So those, that, the whole section on guiding principles, definition, and purposes is a very important one because it defines you and your education law as absolutely unique. You'll have many elements that are similar to other First Nations, especially as um, groups of Anishinaabek or groups of Haudenosaunee 
um, uh, develop their own laws, you'll see commonalities. But because of your location and because of your um, remoteness, cultural factors, um, you know, social factors of the community, health factors of the community, you're going to see some, some differences also appear. And those are very, um, differences are great because they make us rich, they make us unique. So that's the section where you're going to self-describe what you believe to be an education of excellence to produce a First Nation citizen of your language and cultural group. Then the next section in the education law um, talks about responsibilities and roles. So we have the First Nations School Authority, its role. We have the Director of Education, his or her role. Um, and the superintendent, if we're going to be hiring superintendents to evaluate our school systems and make recommendations on um, how we're meeting our own standards, um, how we're comparing maybe to standards of uh, neighboring school boards, that kind of thing. So this is where some of the um, responsible levels of authority need to be clearly defined. So we look at <coughs> this First Nations School Authority as a board that uh, functions to operate the system. Um, the Director of Education reports to that board. Uh, the Director of Education hires from time to time a superintendent to evaluate. So those roles all have to be clearly delineated. And in the, in the um, education law template long paper, those roles are, are clearly given for you. And um, there may be some questions in and around unions, teacher unions. Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario, Ontario Secondary School Teachers Federation, the ability of a principal to hire and fire. So if there's sections of that template that you don't agree with or want in your law, then just ignore that and move on to the other, the other pieces that serve you. Then uh, Diane? from that, yes? Uh, just a couple John? comments. <clears throat> just a couple comments uh, Joanne had made here. Um, and I think that the one is for the first part of it. Uh, our elders have told us that our constitution is in our sacred items, the drums, the feathers, the four directions, our feathers. And then uh, for that last section that you just mentioned, um, that is starting to sound like the system we are under now. Yeah. <clears throat> All the First Nation School Authority and the director? Yeah. Um, you can, if you want to shift how that looks in terms of its hierarchy, you can do whatever you want with that particular section. Um, I, I made it um, a hierarchy of authority only because I wanted to show differing roles. If you want to make it a circle of authority, or you want to make it a council of authority, then you know, you're absolutely completely free to do that and to cherry pick you know, what, what you want from that long paper and use it as you wish. And change everything. Change it. And say, you know, I, I don't agree with it. And make it your own. When, when you want to look at a sample of how this template was used to formulate an education law, you can get a copy of Treaty 2 in Manitoba. Their education law was formulated based on this template. So you'll see that there's lots of things they didn't use, but there's also lots of things that they did use. So their whole governance model is based on Rosso River School and how Rosso River developed their education system. And they liked it so much that they, they took it from a community base into a Treaty 2 based governance system. So you can, you can manage that in any way that you feel is important for your treaty area. And it's true, it's true what Joanne says about our constitution. Our constitution is in our bundles. And that's why I mentioned that sacred law at the beginning because that, um, that sacred law is, um, is very powerful. 
and all the ceremonies that come and the prayers that come from those bundles are change makers. They, they can change the scenario that we're in. And um, even when it seems like we're up against great, great odds or powers far greater than ourselves, when we're aligned with the laws of the Creator and the laws of Mother Earth, we're never going to lose the battle. But we have to ensure that alignment. So that's why when Joanne talks about those bundles and forming the, the foundation of our Constitution, that that's very, very true and, and very clear. So every First Nation needs to have a conversation about that. How does that look for our people? How do we want it to manifest? Do we even want a constitution? So, you know, I don't make any judgments. I just put everything on paper and you can pick and choose. But I think those are really important questions that a First Nation government and community members can embrace. So when we start to look at the education law and we look at school administration, again, you know, how school looks today in 2014 is not how it's going to look 20 years from now. So we need to know as and embrace as um, First Nations that we're in an evolutionary process. And what I personally believe is that we are leading a process of change in education as a whole. Our people are leading it. And we're doing it in small pockets all over the, the country, but we are leading the change in education. And that means our school administration is going to look very different from what is out there today. So, you know, be creative when you're doing your um, education law for school administration. And that also leads you into the whole, I, I would say the most um, challenging part of the law, which is the curriculum and the education standards that you're going to use. And there's no easy way around, you know, doing curriculum. It's hard work. It's long work in terms of uh, looking at the production of curriculum, the engagement with students and parents and community members um, to try out the curriculum and then evaluate it and see what works and what didn't work and the pedagogy that goes along with it. So it's, it's tough work, but it's very beneficial. And it's not the kind of work where each First Nation has to start from ground zero because there's so much to be shared. If we had a national curriculum conference for First Nations, we would see the outstanding work that's being done all across the country in history curriculum, language curriculum, cultural curriculum, you know, all of the, the mathematics and the science curriculum that is Indigenous based. I think we would be really proud of our people if we had such a conference. So putting into your law that um, cultural and linguistic competency in curriculum is very important. Um, is is part should be part of your law and education standards as well. So this is a tough area because unless we have our own education standards, we're going to be always measured against provincial standards, and those provincial standards have never served our people. The fact that we have a 60% dropout rate in their systems of, of schooling in provincial school boards tells us so. So now that, that lays the, the work and the responsibility on First Nations to say, what are our education standards? What are our milestones? Because we need to define that so that our values of what we value to be an educated person is a little bit different from what the province would value as an educated person. So when you talk to our people, our people talk about social and emotional well-being and competency. They talk about the development of your character. You know, when we, we go to those seven sacred laws of our people, you know, and we go to the to um, our, our codes, Haudenosaunee codes about what is a good mind, so we're talking, when we talk about education standards as First Nations, we also talk about character development as part of social and emotional well-being. We talk about spiritual development. 
the spiritual component of education. You know, so there's there's lots that we have in terms of education standards that are very different from the outside. Doesn't mean they're greater than or less than, but we have to begin to define our own standards. And when there's cognitive standards to be met, I believe that we can meet or exceed the cognitive standards and milestones that the province has. Because when our kids are given what they need to be successful in school, within the context and framework of our worldview, they excel. So it's not about provincial content in the curriculum, it's about provincial competencies in the curriculum and how do we teach those same competencies but do it from our own worldview. So we have some work to do in that area. And it's very specialized work and it's the kind of work that maybe you're going to put into your law but then you're going to work collectively with other First Nations to be able to actually do the standards. Then, of course, the other pieces of that education law are the responsibilities for teachers, their qualifications, um, counselors in the school system, the principal, any specialists that you, that you see operating in your school system, or the capacity to hire those specialists for um, diagnosis and treatment and um, placement of our children in specialized programs. So your law needs to focus on those individuals as well. And then the law also looks at cost models, funding formulas, and any regulations. Regulations, after you pass your law, the regulations are really the operational piece. How are we going to make this law work? Because the law sets um, your intent and the regulations set how you're going to make that happen, bring it into operation. So we need, and everybody knows this, modern funding formulas, the old BOF formulas from the 1980s were never meant to run a modern education system. And, um, you know, the funding formulas for, for, um, for us in education, of course, have placed us decades behind. So we'll see what happens with those new commitments and funding. Um, and then, of course, all of those pieces of the law lead to the management and operation of a First Nations school or schools or a whole system. And um, the Community Education Council has its role to participate in the, in the system as well. Those are parents and family members um, extended family, um, elders who want to participate in, in having a say about the school system. And then of course, you know, the authorities for getting second level services, third level services are also part of the law. So I'll stop there. John, are there any questions to this point? No, I'm not seeing any. Okay, so just to summarize what we've talked about on this particular tem template, PowerPoint, we're looking then at next steps. What do, what do we have to do to get busy on all of this? Um, first of all, you know, if your First Nation government is interested in developing its own constitution, work should begin on that. If they're not at that level yet, and most are not, um, building a First Nation education law doesn't have to wait for the Constitution. You can start to develop your own education law and it will be authorized by your First Nation government. You need <clears throat> to look at a governance model for education and that's what Joanne raised a little bit earlier. You know, this the system of um, a school authority and a director of education and superintendents and blah, 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 that all sounds kind of like the provincial system. Yes, it does. Um, and it may be a necessary starting point for some First Nations. Others may be far beyond that and they have their own way of governance set in place, which is, you know, of course the Anishinaabek um, system, which is, you know, they've done 20 years of work on their governance model and their funding formulas. And they need to be applauded for that work because it's tough work and they did it at a time and a place where they were 
they were ahead of ahead, you know, and they were forward thinking. So every First Nation government should really start looking at its own governance model for education, how it wants to set itself up in the community, and how it's going to be in relationship to other First Nation governments and their systems, how it's going to be in relationship to the provincial government and its systems, the Ministry of Education and its systems. You know, so, so those Gov the governance model is a is a very um, important piece, and of course the funding formulas. And we don't have to start from zero on funding formulas because we have lots of really important papers that have been developed in the last ten years on funding formulas. And probably one of the best papers that I've personally seen comes out of the First Nation Education Council of Quebec, and they have um, developed some new funding formulas. If we're going to see that these laws are put in place, that regulations that then follow the laws, it only follows that policy templates would be developed. And those policy templates would assist First Nations who want to develop their curriculum, who want to develop um, education standards, human resources, administration, and so on. So why wouldn't we talk to other First Nations who are ahead of us with these pieces and ask them to share and help us. And so, you know, if there's a central place like Onika that would do policy templates, then that could serve the rest of the First Nations in Ontario who need them. Some do not. But for those who do need them, it would be a real tool. And then we always have to look at, you know, what are our neighbors doing? Our neighbors in, in the United States, in Hawaii, in uh, New Zealand, and our neighbors in other provinces and territories of Canada, because they have so much in terms of best practice, materials, uh, teacher competencies, cultural standards um, for the classroom, for teachers, for administration, for school boards. Um, so much has been developed that will assist us in, in putting together our education law. So this is a challenge really to Canada to forge a new relationship with First Nations as a first order of government with our inherent rights and our treaty rights to self-determination, to self-government, to jurisdiction over education. And when we're talking about a First Nation Education Act, as we, we had previously, we, what, what I say is that we need enabling legislation, but not for us. We need it for the government of Canada to squarely sit on its statutory obligation to acknowledge First Nation jurisdiction in all of its diversity throughout the, the country and also to acknowledge its obligation to fund First Nation education. I also believe that the federal and provincial governments need to align their laws to support First Nation jurisdiction over education, and they need to also implement UNDRIP, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. The Government of Canada must position itself to make targeted investments over time to create equity and a new funding relationship with First Nation governments so that our education funds are not program-based funds coming from ANSI that change every year, the reporting systems change, the, the goals of those programs change, the goals of the programs are never designed by us. They're always overarching um, positions given by the Government of Canada for what they believe is important in our education systems. So these targeted investments need to create equity. That is our jurisdiction over education which in which we determine what our educational goals are, our curriculum and our standards. And we need a new funding relationship with the Government of Canada. And we need those new formulas and mechanisms to be put in place so that it's statutory funding. Funding for First Nation education cannot be programmatic. It cannot be program based. There must be a stable, of statutory funding 
given by Treasury Board every year for this purpose. So a lot of the stuff that we talked about today, we, we say, how can we ever do that? It seems like a daunting task. It's so much work. Where do we start? So where I will always start is um, with the belief in the Creator that the Creator can do anything, that when we align ourselves with spiritual law and natural law, that the Creator will always um, help us in the challenge that's ahead for us, and that if we, if we believe in a system that is truly going to produce First Nation citizens that have fallen in love with creation, that know their languages and their ceremonies, they can carry that forward into the coming generations that our great, 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 great grandchildren will have as much or more of that love for the land that we have today than we've done our job. So I think about, I think about those prayers and this, this is a term in Mohawk that means when you pray for these things out loud and it's in alignment with the Creator's purpose for life, that you, it's already, everything you've prayed for is already done. It's set in the future. It's completed. And everything that we as individuals do from this day forward contributes to that finished product. So um, I really believe that, that we're going in a great direction as First Nations. We need each other. We need to self-support each other because if we don't, um, no one First Nation is going to be able to to do everything on their own. So that's why Onika put these on their website, all the resources that you need. A First Nation lawmaking protocol. It's in some detail. It's maybe 25 pages long. It goes through all the details of what you might consider if you were going to do a protocol. Um, the, the law template that we just went through, of course I referred to it as 90 pages long. That has lots of information for you to look at. Um, and then there's also this piece, which is the historical highlights leading to the development of First Nation education law. So this, this piece is important because it comes in chunks of information. It's, it starts with um, traditional law. It starts with um, uh, the royal proclamation, treaty making time. Um, talking a little bit about Sheila Carr Stewart's paper on treaty making, treaties no numbers 1 to 11, and talking about um, the shifts and changes that have happened in First Nation education leading us to this point. So the, lots of information, background information that if you didn't know anything about First Nation education in Canada, read the paper, you're going to know what some of the, the important highlights are. And that will also give you some background when you're developing your law as to your authorities and your principles and your purposes for education. And this is where you can find more information. Onika at onika.com. Roxanne Manitowabi, of course, is the executive director. That's the phone number for the office. And then um, for any other questions that you might have, there's my phone number and email. So I'll stop there and any any questions on this or comments? Uh, Diane, I don't know if this is uh, my place, uh, but I was just thinking out loud that we have um, we have that uh, information area on our website as a point of contact. I wonder if it would be beneficial for others um, to have contact contact information for any of those communities or organizations who have already done the work. And then the second piece to that would be um, some way for those who are interested in collaborating uh, with others who are trying to do the same work. I think that's a really important point because um, when I <clears throat> was in an Anishinaabek education conference uh, last week, what happened was one of the small First Nations um, chief was there, and he said, "You know, how do we, how do we as a small First Nation get started on something like this? We don't have the budget for it. We don't have the technical expertise. Um, uh, we're not sure about the neighboring First Nations who might want to work with us on this. So I think your idea, John, is a good one. You know, those who want to collaborate, um, sign on to this 
particular part of the website and those who have um, things that they can offer and share. That would be amazing. Perfect. Um, so I'm not seeing any uh, further questions or comments at this point, Diane. Okay. Well, I have that it's 20 to 11 if you want to get up and stretch. The second part of the, the webinar is really going to look at the lawmaking protocol. If you're interested in that, you can stay on the line. Um, if not, then um, you can get this um, information law or education law template at the Onika website as well. So I want to thank you for being present with us this morning. Uh, Diane, one I've got uh, a question here from Joanne. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at the end, Diane, at the end of the day, are we still going to be looking to another government for approval? We are not going to look to any other government for approval other than our own First Nation governments. And that's why everybody in that First Nation who's interested in education and its outcomes needs to have a voice in making their own education law. Because if we don't make our own law, Governments external to us will make the laws for us. And we saw that with the Government of Canada coming forward with the First Nation Education Act. And they said the only ones exempt from this whole process are self-governing First Nations in the province, well, in our province it would be Ontario. So who are those? Who, 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 who has signed an agreement in principle or is self-governing? There's only one, and that's Akwizasni. And they just signed their AIP last fall. So that means everybody else would have fallen under the First Nation Education Act of the Government of Canada. So this is important work that we're engaging in now, and uh, we need to we need to collectively move forward with it and help each other. <laughs>